Our Old Testament reading is from the third chapter of the prophet Jonah. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God said, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said that he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I don't know about you, but I don't keep up to date with practically any shows that people are probably watching now. That I don't think streaming has helped me keep up with what others are watching. Streaming has only helped me catch up on things I missed long ago. <laughs> is that over the last couple of months, is that I've been working myself through that series of CSI New York, Crime Scene Investigation New York. That in the midst of making my way through, there's something that always has struck me as wrong as I listen to the theme song of that show. Just like all the other CSIs, it certainly is a Who song. But the Who song that is played is Baba O'Reilly, and the words that were selected for this intro theme to this, song, this, scene, uh, this crime scene investigation says, I don't need to fight to prove I'm right. I don't need to be forgiven. Really? For a show about violent killers, rapists, pedophiles, and all sorts of other people, we choose these words. I don't need to prove that I'm right, that I don't need to be forgiven. That maybe that's why roughly around season five, they took out those lyrics from the intro. That it just struck me as kind of strange. But isn't that true? So much other parts of life. That that's that modern motto, I don't need to be forgiven. What is there to be forgiven for? That I can do what I want, when I want, how I want. I am free to choose what I want, to believe what I want. I can do what I desire. I mean, you can, but it doesn't mean that you should. That it may not be good for you and it may certainly not be good for others is that we are not simply free to do whatever, whenever, however that there is this thing of truth that we have to grapple with and begin to think of. See, as I think about this topic, I couldn't help but think of something I'd seen several years ago. That is this wonderful thing that kind of gets to this whole question of truth. That it's this picture here on the screen. Is that man pulled over for driving into oncoming traffic assures officers he's just living his own truth. That are there any police officers out there? Would that work for you? <laughs> that I'm just living my own truth. But what does it mean? In this world where we are called to hear that very word, of truth for our lives, that word that is there for us. Today we step into that very book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 3 is what we heard just a few moments ago, but it also is one of those accounts that we know much more of that story. That Jonah is called to that very place to go and preach that very promise that God will indeed bring justice, bring truth to Nineveh. And so Jonah is sent. He is sent to Nineveh to bring that very truth to bear. And Nineveh was a place 
that was filled with violence, a people of violence. It was a place that needed to hear God's truth. But maybe that's not quite where that book of Jonah is ultimately trying to lead us. See, as we step into that very word that we hear of our reading today, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against its mes- it, that message that I tell you. This is a direct quote of Jonah chapter 1. The same verses, the same words, except for those very things of jo- God said to Jonah the second time. And we know what had happened. We know what happened that first time when God said, get up, Jonah, and go. What does Jonah do? Jonah keeps going the other way. One commentator says that it's a marvel that the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time at all. For he had so thoroughly disobeyed, so thoroughly went against God's very calling on his life that God said, get up and go. But Jonah went down to the seashore, down into the boat, down under the deck, and then when the God had sent a storm to turn him around and call him back, that Jonah even said to the very sailors, throw me over the side of the boat that I may go down and down and down to the watery depths. Is that Jonah found himself even willing to go down into death that he didn't have to do what God desired. And yet, after Jonah went down and down and down some more, comes my favorite verse of the entire Scriptures. Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. The Lord commanded that great fish, and it vomited Jonah up. that Jonah was vomited up into that very dry ground. That the Lord, even after all of this disobedience, after all of His ways that He went against them, God still was not done with Jonah. God's grace comes in, He steps in, and a second time, a God of second and third and fourth chances steps into His life and says, Jonah, get up and go. Now, we might think that this would probably be one of those life-changing situations, (laughs) That maybe after you've gone through those kinds of situations, that maybe something might change in your life. You might hear a little bit of a wake-up call. That somehow Jonah's heart may have been changed in some way, but Jonah's heart still wasn't in it. Sure enough, he went those 25 days' journey to Nineveh. Certainly enough, Jonah went and preached to the city is that he came into it preaching what is there. That summary of his preaching, a summary of a total of eight words. Now, I know there's probably some today that might say, an eight-word sermon sounds nice. In Hebrew, it's only five words. That sounds nicer. (laughs) Well, your wish is not going to be granted today, just to let you know. But what are those eight words that Jonah now brings in his lackluster preaching, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown? I mean, was this the summary of all of Jonah's preaching there? Yet 40 days and Nineveh's going to be overthrown. Was this a summary that was there, or is this just, as one commentator put it, a half-hearted preacher dragging his feet all the way, asking, how can I do this so that the Ninevites don't repent and that this God doesn't deliver them? In Jonah's preaching to the people, he doesn't identify who's going to do this. He doesn't identify why it's going to happen. He doesn't call them to repentance. He does not preach their sins. He does not appeal to God's grace. He does not give an invitation or an encouragement for anyone to turn to God in prayer, to turn to God in confession, to turn to God in worship. 
that Jonah just does this mic drop moment of the Lord in 40 days, is, sorry, is that in 40 days Nineveh shall be, tra- be destroyed. Good luck with that. Bye-bye then. Have a terrible day. I mean, what kind of preaching is this? We get eight words, and yet the Jonah who in chapter 2 had said salvation belongs to the Lord, that we got nine verses, not eight words, nine verses of Jonah praying for himself in his own personal predicament, he can only muster eight words to this town that as God says that are so spiritually ignorant that they don't even know their right hand from their left. Now, what's going on here? Why would God's prophet not only run, but even when he goes, does it with such dragging of feet and then in chapter 4 gets so upset that God doesn't prove true and God relents? not destroying the city. See, Jonah was one who found himself struggling with his own sin, dealing with his own issue. Jonah was blinded to the things that were there. He thought that there's nothing here to be forgiven of. I love I love how many times I've had it happen, and I know others have said this to me on the way out on occasion, is that they've heard a sermon that's being preached, of maybe some law is being preached about something of God's Word, and they think or they say to me, I really wish that so-and-so was here to hear that sermon. They really needed to hear that. That's how Jonah was. They needed the sermon. They needed the law. But God's law is good. God's law is one that comes to reveal our sin, not simply our neighbor's sin or other's sin. God's law comes to reveal your sin. That Jonah was one who believed that the problem was with them, not him. The problem was with the world and not God's prophets. And so Jonah, like so many, played those mental games of I can do this, but they can't do that. That Jesus once commented to the people of his own day, Is that how truly did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me? That how do we repent in a world that doesn't believe in repentance? But how do we repent when we don't see that we have a problem? So God comes to bring His law, to bring His Word, to bring His truth, to bring His very care unto us. That certainly we struggle with this question of judgment and repentance. We struggle with all of those questions of God's law. But the fact is, is that we have to ask that question, what does it mean that we have a God of love? is that when we see real needs, real sin, real problems, real pain, don't we desire for God to come and do something about it? That if you were going home from work or even from this place and you saw something of a crime being perpetrated against someone else, someone being hurt and harmed, would you just shrug your shoulders and say, well, these things happen? Would we desire to have a God that's just simply a God of absolute love that just says, well, what do you want me to do about it? No, God's love is one that needs justice, one that cries out for truth, one that cries out for judgment that we may judge the very situation and do something in response that without a God of justice, that there is no hope for this world. 
But if there truly is a God of justice, what hope is there for us? For just like Jonah, we find ourselves struggling with our own sins, our own needs, our own blindness to where we have gone wrong. That we may begin begin to get angry at others of what they've done to us or what they've done to others. But how do we begin to hold and harbor such anger, such hatred, when we think of all that Christ has forgiven of us, of all that He has washed clean, that He knows us. He knows all our thoughts, all our wishes, all our desires, and yet He still loves us. That His love, His grace is just as true as there for us today. That as one person put it, that Jonah gave the worst gospel presentation ever. And yet, what did God do? That miraculously, the people of Nineveh still repented. They still turned to the Lord. That what is God able to do in our own lives? God is able to work in us and through us, no matter how imperfect, no matter how bad, no matter how messed up things have gotten, is that God's grace is there for us. But His law comes to reveal that sin so that we may know of just how glorious His forgiveness, His grace has been. But His law is also there to guide us, to lead us, to show us how we are to live. The Ten Commandments aren't simply those things that just simply say, don't do these things. And we begin to think, well, I haven't stabbed anyone lately, so I think I'm doing okay. Now, when we begin to think about God's commands, what does He give them for? That He might protect parents and children and their relationship for one another. That He might protect our life and our very well-being, not that we might be torn down and treated wrongly by others, is that He gives us His law that He might protect marriage and love, that He might protect our possessions, our reputation, our life, and our well-being. That Luther encouraged us to reflect upon each day as we go about our life, what does this look like today? What does it look like for me to honor my parents, to love my children? What does it mean to respect and uplift life? What does it mean to give that very testimony of that gift of marriage and love and the very blessing of sexuality? Where does God desire for me to walk in His grace, live in His love, to see that the problem is not with them, the problem is with me? See, we so often sometimes pray, God, what do you want me to do with my life? Jonah twice had God directly say, Jonah, this is what I want you to do with, my, with your life. And Jonah shook like a magic eight ball and said, ask again later, God. That Jonah heard it, and yet... By his sin, he still resisted it. See, where is God desiring to speak into your life? Where is God speaking his word that we ask, God, what do you want? What will you say to me? See, I can't help but think of one more picture. That very image of one who desperately desires. Man sitting literally three feet away from Bible asks for God to speak to him. That where is God desiring to speak to your life, to call you back through His law of truth, His word of grace? Where does God want you to hear the whole call of His very promises that are yours in Christ Jesus? Then may He lead us ever to that very cross of Christ. May we hear His voice for us that we may continue to enjoy that peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.